Hey, it's regular season time. The perfect time to join us here on Bills by the Numbers. We're presented by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Coming up, how is Buffalo's 2023 roster better than its 2022 iteration? And in what ways might it be most different? We discuss. USA Today's Doug Farrar joins us to discuss which new additions could have the biggest roles for the Bills this fall. And Steve, again, takes his best guesses in the numbers game. Let's get roster ready! Back for regular season discussion here on Bills by the Numbers. Bills Wall of Famer Steve Tasker, Bills Insider Chris Brown with you. And though the 53-man roster may have a tweak or two here or there, Buffalo's regular season crew is essentially set. First and foremost, Steve, were there any surprises for you in terms of who made the roster and who uh, did not make it? A couple. I think Kingsley Jonathan is a big surprise, I think, for some people. Um, the fact that that he played as well as he did and really earned a spot on the 53. I mean, that guy's going to be a part of the rotation. I think they really like him. I think his upside is really big, and he's progressed. You know, picture a guy playing defensive end having the kind of progress that Josh Allen had as a quarterback. That's what I see in Kingley Jonathan, and the guy's going to be a, a really good pass rusher, I think. Brandon Bean, after the roster was set, said Kingsley Jonathan has a relentless motor, and that, combined with the skill set that he possesses, certainly has his arrow pointing up. I don't know if I was terribly surprised with any of the decisions in terms of who made it, but Vandemark going from practice yeah. squad – to swing tackle. This is a this is a coaching staff and a personnel department that generally leans in favor of veterans and guys that they know they can trust. And so I thought that Vandemark would make the roster, but I thought Questenberry would make it too. And then over the course of the season, maybe Vandemark would overtake Questenberry as the swing tackle. But they cut the court and said, Vandemark is our guy. We'll get a fourth tackle and move on from Questenberry, and they did that in the form of Jermaine Effetti, who was probably going to be the fourth tackle, the veteran they picked up as a free agent. But that was, that was a shocker to me. That is a rapid ascension that you don't often see, particularly from an undraft, former undrafted right. rookie. Looking at this roster on its surface, where do you feel it is better than it was a season ago, Steve? Yeah, that's a, good, that's a really good question. It might be... You could, there's a lot of places you could go, defensive, yeah. defensive line, defensive end, and tackle. The secondary corners, because we know so much more about the guys that are there. Uh, and they got a year under their belt, yes. the two rookies the offensive line, The offensive line certainly has been bolstered, to say the least, uh, with the guys you just mentioned, but also the two guards yep. uh, and, the, and the depth behind both of them uh, have been really upgraded. Running back, same thing. Uh yeah, this is a roster that is has been beefed up both in its depth and quality of depth and the competition to get on the field in a, in a big way at all of those position groups. So yeah. you can point to maybe the only place where they might be a little less than they were a year ago would be maybe the middle linebacker where Tremaine Edmonds you know, went off to Chicago. But that is it. That one spot uh, out of the 22 starters plus the guys, the extra guys that rotate in as, as regular down and distance guys in personnel packages. Every single other gr position group you can say is better. Yeah, and, you know, you mentioned the three that came to my mind, offensive line, defensive line, running back. I think that running back might be the one that is most easily identifiable by the average fan. James right. Cook is extraordinarily more talented than Devin Singletary as the feature back. Damian Harris is a better power runner than Zach Moss could have ever hoped to be. And Latavius Murray has found the fountain of youth at age 33. I am just stunned at how spry, quick, and powerful he still is at age 33. Top to bottom on that position group, they are miles better than they were last season at that spot. And I think that's going to be readily noticeable for fans from the jump. Yeah, I think you're going to – plus with the, the offensive line that's been upgraded up inside, this is a team that's going to be able to run it whenever they want, theoretically. I mean, you're going to – that's the idea. 
I mean, they're just going to, listen, we're, it's second and eight instead of dropping back. We're yeah. going to hand it off and, and expect to get six yards and get into a, th- you know, a, th- a third and two, third and one. Um, more op- options are available in the run. In my opinion, there are more situations on the field during a game where they're going to have the freedom to feel confident in handing it off now. And I think defenses will feel that as yeah. well. And I think that's a, that's a great place to, to be. All right, you touched on it already, but let's let's look at it a little bit deeper. An area of concern that has drawn your attention with respect to the roster, be it a specific yeah. position or position group. I think it has to be the linebacker. Certainly, you've still got Matt Milano out there, and he's going to continue to play at an all-pro level. Uh, I like the young guys out there, Dorian Williams and Terrell Bernards, although Bernards' preseason was absolutely, and no pun intended, hamstrung by his hamstring injury. He couldn't prove how good he could be or bad he could be. He couldn't. He was never in the conversation because we couldn't see him play because of the hamstring. Uh, I've got high hopes for him because of his experience for a year in the system. Uh, Dodson is the guy as well who really got most of the work uh, because of the injuries around him. Uh, A.J. Klein is gonna, could be a factor if they bring him back off off the street and re-sign him. A lot of the, a lot, oh, there's a lot still in that. There's some question marks in there. And I think some of it, maybe for the, you know, for the first time in a long time, it's a position group where we think there's something more behind the, what we see on the field. The leadership, the communication, who's got a, the best grasp of, of the adjustment packages they have to have when the motion happens and the personnel changes. Um, there's a lot of that stuff we don't know about and don't know how the coaching staff feels about it. Right. I think you touched on it there right at the very end. The concern at the middle linebacker position lies in the unknown. For the yes. last five years, you knew definitively right. Tremaine Edmonds is your starting middle linebacker. He's running the defense. He's a supreme athlete. You're good. There was no concern whatsoever because you knew what you were getting there, even if there were some detractors of Tremaine Edmonds, and there were some out there among the Bills fan base. But you knew what you were getting every single week. Now, you're not quite sure what you're getting because, you know, when the roster was set, even then, the starting middle linebacker had not been declared by the coaching staff or the personnel department. Now, saying all that, I don't know why I feel this way. I just have a gut feeling. Terrell Bernard still has a chance to win this job. He Mm -hmm. missed the entire preseason, as Steve mentioned, with a hamstring injury. I think he's still going to get a look at it because the preseason ends. You still have two weeks before the opener. Bernard is back on the field now. And I think if he shows the right things in the practice setting, I still think he could win the job. And the main reason why is because I think he offers the best coverage ability of the candidates at that position. He's a better coverage player than Tyrell Dotson. He's a better coverage player than even the practice squad guy that they just signed Christian Kirksey, who's a proven veteran in this league and to me represents the insurance, the veteran insurance that A.J. Klein was. But A.J. Klein isn't on the roster anymore. So Christian Kirksey is your veteran insurance if all else fails. But he, too, is a little limited in the coverage aspect of the game, especially now at 31 years old. I think Bernard, because of his coverage ability, is going to be given every opportunity leading up to the opener to be your starting middle linebacker even so and you're right I, I would agree with that I think you've got to error on the side of having the cover guy on the field rather than the run stopping guy particularly since you got Puna Ford up there Daquan Jones Jordan Phillips Ed Oliver you got some defensive tackles that will hold their ground in the run game and it will allow linebackers who maybe and I'll say this Dorian Williams Terrell Bernard those guys are linebackers they were college linebackers they're, they're a little undersized, but they, they run and they hit. They're going to know how to tackle people. And I think that's, that's going to be a given at this level, particularly with the guys in front of them that, that they have. So I think the run game and whatever lesser abilities they have in the run game because of their size is going to be mitigated by the fact they got some big, strong deep quality defensive tackles ahead of them. So I think you're right. The linebacker position is going to be probably a little undersized. And it's, of course it's going to be because Tremaine Edmonds was a physical freak in there. He's 6'5 plus, 250 pounds. Uh, but I think that these guys, I think they're going to all look like Matt Milano out there. They're going to be athletes. And if you're going to make them, if you're going to error, you're going to error on the side of having guys that can run and cover rather than step up into a, a hole, take on a guard, 
and thump in the run. All right. So what do you anticipate will be most different about this 2023 version of the Bills in comparison to last year's version? You can talk offense, defense, anything. What will look most I different this year compared to last year? On off, I, I think on both sides of the ball, be I think Kincaid's going to add a dimension that they haven't seen. They're going to have two tight ends on the field a little bit more than they did before. They were the 3% of their plays, they had two tight ends on the field. On Conversely, on defense, I think Sean McDermott calling the play is going to be a big difference. I think you're going to see more pressure on the quarterback more often than you did under Leslie Frazier, and I think maybe I don't know. I don't even know if I've seen enough evidence to say this that there may be more diff personnel packages defensively than we've seen in the past. They're ninety percent nickel. They teams. One of the problems the Bills posed for teams is they never play anything but nickel. So whatever matchup you had, you had to stick with it and you had to take it. You know they weren't going to change for you. So I think you may get some more guys on the field defensively rather than that back seven that we're so used to seeing. You may get some 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 different people. Yeah, and I would say on offense, while the group has a chance to be more explosive after the catch, Hardy and Kincaid most notably fall into that category, Sherfield to a certain extent as well. I think they are going to be a more efficient offense. And what I mean by that is more high percentage throws where they're relying on the receiving targets to get the yards afterwards rather than Josh chucking it down the field on low percentage plays and hoping it happens. I think they're going to become a more high-efficiency offense because you know they're going to see more of the two high-shell looks from defenses. And we've seen Kansas City figure it out offensively. They go and win a Super Bowl. We saw Cincinnati figure it out last year. Basically, Joe Burrow turns into the second coming of Tom Brady with efficiency, quick throws out of his hand in 2.3 seconds they get all the way to the AFC championship game I think the Bills have come to understand they have to adopt a similar approach and to me they have the weapons to execute it now and now it's on Josh to take those check downs or those shorter higher percentage throws to stay on the field finish more drives with points and this is and, and I'm saying this about the second best offense in football right but I think when you get to the playoffs that kind of play is what is going to help you advance more. And I agree with you on the defensive side of the ball, Steve, that you are going to have more exotic looks from Sean McDermott. We hear him use this phrase all the time with, with regard to pressure. And now it's going to slip my mind. I just lost it. It's a two-word phrase that he uses all the time. It's something like, uh, disciplined pressure or something to that effect. Right. His pressure calls are not reckless. They don't calculated risk. That's right. what he said. Calculated risk. And I think he is going to use risk at the right times with regard to pressures to get quarterbacks on the ground more often and to force more turnovers. That's how I think this 2023 yeah. version is going to be different. I than think last. that's the entire philosophy. They're going to try and, and tailor their defensive calls to get more turnovers. If they can get more turnovers, it's going to lead to more wins, period. Your offense gets the ball more. It takes opportunity away. It's a double win on both sides of the ball. And they just didn't do it enough in the last few years. Yeah. So next on the docket here, Steve, finally, what position group do you believe – made the biggest upgrades from last season. I think we've all agreed there are several position groups that are more improved from last year, but which position group had their level raised the most? Like, who looks miles better than they did last year, position group-wise? I mean, we talked O-line, D-line, running back. Yeah. How would you – How would, which say, one is most – I would say the defensive line. Okay. Uh, the defensive tackle group is going to be much, much better. They're going to be hard to get out of the way. And I think with the addition of Leonard Floyd, even in the absence of Vaughn in the first month of the season because he's on PUP, I, I, with Greg Rousseau coming back healthy, um, I think this defensive line group is going to be – there are going to be times when it can dominate. I've said this as well. The offensive line, there are going to be games when they can dominate as well. Finish if they the all game. stay healthy, finish the game – uh, much like they did against the Green Bay Packers a year ago where they just strangled the life out of them. They didn't do anything risky at all on either side of the ball, and the Packers just ran out of game. They were never getting back into that game. 
Um, so you're saying they might be able to do an even better job of that this year? I think you'll see more games like that in the second half where the team just just loses the air out yeah, of their just game. Just chokes they the just, game out. They just can't make anything happen. I, I'm going to go back to the running back well here. I, I am just so – I don't know if I would have said this at the beginning of training camp that the running back position is the most improved position on this football team in comparison to last year. But after seeing what Latavius Murray did in training camp in the preseason, like I said earlier, top to bottom, that group is so much better than last year. It's, it's mind-blowing to me. Because you think at the beginning of last year, Devin Singletary, Zach Moss, and James Cook, who they wouldn't let on the field, and now you have James Cook, Damian Harris, and Latavius Murray. Like, to yeah. me, it is it is so far better than what it was last year. Yeah. And I don't even know if enough people I'm, realize how much better it is. It I, is decidedly better yeah. than last year. And there was time last year where you just you were just kind of begging Josh just to dump it off. And I think you're going to see times when James Cook, Kincaid, Dawson Knox, uh, Murray, or or Harris, any of them get a throw where they've got lots of space, you know, where they, where Josh, you know, is looking one way, just comes back and dumps it off. I think just the ability and the desire to do that and the willingness for Josh to make that decision instead of trying to make the impossible throw and some kind of pulling it off, yeah. but um, is just going to make this offense really difficult to get off the field on third down. And those are safe throws. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll be really interested to see. We expand this discussion now as we project what some of the newest additions to the roster this season could do in terms of production on the offensive and defensive sides of the ball, respectively. Here to help us project is NFL editor for USA Today, Doug Farrar, who also has the X's and O's podcast with Greg Cosell. Here is Doug. All right, Doug. So in talking about the new additions to Buffalo's roster, both offense and defense, we'll kind of click through some of these as we move along. But through the course of the preseason, I was kind of taken with what I saw on second and long from Buffalo's mm -hmm. offense. That was typically a Cole Beasley down, second and long, uh, you know, where he'd get, you know, a four-yard pass, get like three or four yards after that, and then it's third and manageable every single time, which is why the Bills, you know, the last few years have been up near the top of the league in third down conversion rate. Deontay Hardy and Dalton Kincaid seem to be the two guys that are going to fill that second and long roll, do you expect it to be executed in similar fashion to what we saw with Beasley, or might they provide a different element to that second and long passing game? I think several different elements, guys. And uh, as always, thank you for having me. Uh, with with Kincaid, I mean, I'm not saying he's this player now, but there were so many comps to Travis Kelsey, and I think we've discussed this on the show before, just in his ability to find holes and zones, gaps in coverage. He's so attuned to that, and he has the the physical tools to make that happen. With Hardy, um, you know, he's had – there's some certain health things and just getting him on the field. But when he's on the field, both from the slot and outside, he can win in the sort of 8 to 15-yard air yard area. So all of a sudden, you're, you're, you're going from second and long to third and short – well, you might be going for second and long all of a sudden now to first and 10, because if you've got Hardy running, you know, maybe something straight up the numbers and Kincaid running any sort of post or over or whatnot, and he's so attuned to getting open in coverage, you know, now you have different ways of doing it. And of course you have Diggs and Gabe Davis and, and the running backs we're going to talk about, which which add a different complexion to the run game. I know that's been a, a point of focus for a long time. But I think, you know, the Beasley way, which is sort of a Wes Welker light of, you know, <laughs> it's it's second and nine would take the three yard in cut and, you know, go up three yards. And now it's third and three. And that's fine. I think they can be much more explosive with the guys they have now. Okay. Right. And it, one of the things about it as well is that there's a lot of question marks coming in. There's only three guys in the room from last year's squad in the wide receiver spot, and now your second tight end is this guy, Kincaid, who seems to be the real deal. You've got nice. James Cook, who has elevated past uh, Devin Singletary or in his absence. So there's a lot of new faces. And for a team that ran fewer tight end sets than anybody in the National Football League last year, to have Kincaid in the mix, defenses, I think the first month of the season here, 
I think the Bills are going to be working with a clean slate, and defenses won't yes. know what they're facing. Very much so, and I know that Brandon Bean talked about that after they took Kincaid because they gave uh, uh, Dawson Knox a big extension last year, and now they take a tight end in the first round, and this is like 4%. 12 personnel or whatever last year by far the lowest in the league it wasn't even close and uh brandon bean said part of what we want to do with these two tight end sets and it's very much what the chiefs do is we want to affect when and how defenses play nickel and how spread out they have to be and the thing with those two tight end sets the chiefs ran uh more 12 than any two two tight ends than any team except the ravens and more three tight end sets than any team in the league period which may surprise you if you think about the Chiefs and, oh, it's just a spread offense. Well, not really. And what those two tight end and, and sometimes three tight end sets allow you to do is really affect more horizontally because you have those two tight ends. Well, now you're thinking horizontally because that could be a heavy package where you're going to run. And, well, now you have Damian Harris, who could be kind of what they hoped Zach Moss would be, sort of that more power guy. Latavius Murray has some of that, too. So really what the Bills are trying to do is to cover all the bases as far as how defenses are spaced, how they have to align, and it really allows them kind of the illusion of complexity thing, where you really don't know what we're going to be doing based on our personnel. And I think more and more NFL offenses are really looking to have that, have the personnel to line up with the playbook to be able to do anything out of anything. Right. All right, so handicap this if you could, Doug. Use your Make your best hypothesis here. As you mentioned, Bills last in the league in 12 personnel usage. They have Kincaid now. They have power backs that could definitely provide the illusion of the run game in a 12 personnel set. How high does their percentage go? Does it get to 20%? I mean, because I still think at the end of the day, this is an 11 personnel team. So where does 12 fit in? Does it get up to 20%? Does it get to 30%? And I don't know about you, but I'm a proponent of that is going to be heavily used in the red zone. Yes. Well, that's, I mean, that's where you want to do it. I think it will be, I think, I think where you'll see a lot of 12 is in the run game and they'll, they'll start to integrate more play action off of the 12 personnel runs because that will start to work in a more cohesive fashion because Damian Harris is really an underrated power runner. And Latavius Murray, as I said, has some elements of that too. So really then it becomes, well, what are our passing concepts out of this? And Dalton Kincaid is a legitimate deep threat tight end. He's not, he's not just a blocker who's going to come off and, and Dawson Knox, you know, he's obviously got some red zone chops as well. So it really does set them up. It's like the Eagles last year. They would throw deep out of 13 and run heavy out of three and four receiver sets. You never knew what you would have to deal with with their offense based on their personnel. And I think, you know, and obviously, you know, you get Damian Harris, you draft Osiris Torrance, you get another tight end in there. Um, And Kincaid is not a great blocker. He's not terrible, but that's really not what you want him on the field for. But they are seeming to be changing their philosophy. And the run game has been a mixed bag. We know this. But they're really, I mean, the whole point of this to me seems to be setting it to where Josh Allen doesn't have to be Superman on every play for this to work. Right. And if the guys up front as well, I mean, a lot of people have poo-pooed the Bills' offensive line because they, they didn't put any assets. But, and, and yet the biggest free agent contract they gave out was to uh, Connor McGovern, who is, yeah. you know, a guard. Then they spent their second round draft pick on another guard. And then so they and then they brought in David Edwards, who was a starting guard for the for the uh, Los Angeles Rams in their Super Bowl run. Uh, yep. They really put some effort into fixing what's in front of Josh Allen. Forget the weapons. Um, how do you, do you think that's going to change who and how he plays? Or is there a chance that this team, if these all guys all play on the upside, I mean, how much does it change your philosophy anyway? I mean, you're still going to throw the football, even if you can run it like a steamroller. Well, it's not just the guards they get, especially Torrance. I mean, it's it's yes, you're you're expending all this capital on this position, but it's the kind of guard Torrance is. He is an absolute power mover. You know, not the best pass blocking guard in this class, but most certainly the most just pure power guy. And he blocked for Anthony Richardson at Florida, so. You have all those elements where you understand the QB run game because you've run a lot of, I mean, 
a lot of the stuff he ran at Florida, he's going to be able to come right in and just do that because he's familiar with it. Um, when we talk about the overall offensive philosophy, you know, I think later in the season they tried to put together a cohesive run game, and they're telling you with their personnel now, well, this is what we want to do. We want it to be not balanced in a way where you're not going to take the ball to Josh Allen's hands because he's an absolute – he's Thanos with the beat ball. I mean, he – we saw that this preseason, he makes throws that no other quarterback can and probably should, you know, the cross body stuff that we saw this preseason, but they have that. They're not going to stop using that as an asset. But again, that balance brings you back to we're more integrated. Everything works together. And it's not up to Josh to do some just crazy, insane thing every three plays just so we can try and get to the Super Bowl. Last one I've got for you. Uh, Doug is on the defensive side of the ball. We know Von Miller is out of the equation for the first four weeks yeah. as he goes on reserve PUP. Leonard Floyd was a late season, late off season pickup. And what do you think is realistic for Bills fans to expect from him, knowing mm -hmm. he's going to be a big part of this equation from a pass rush perspective? I think he is underrated as a run defender, where he's always been good, in yes. my opinion, setting the edge. But knowing he's kind of the guy for the first four weeks opposite Greg Rousseau, what do you think is realistic to expect from him? Yeah, it's a boogie free zone now too, right? Um, right. Yeah. So they're, they're making some they're making some quick quick changes there. Uh, Floyd has you know, and he came out of college and he was like two hundred and thirty pounds basically. So people thought he couldn't defend the run. He's always, like as you said, underrated in that regard. He has been extremely productive as a as an outside pass rusher over the last few seasons and never really got his due for it. So he can do a lot of the things Von Miller can from a pure speed to power, speed around the edge. So he might even be a little faster than Von at this point in Von's career. I mean, Von is a first ballot Hall of Famer as far as I'm concerned, and the tools he brings, the, the long arm where he just pushes the tackle into the quarterback, I've never seen anyone do that better than him. But Floyd... And, it, of course, we don't know because preseason is preseason. I would imagine that with Sean McDermott in, in charge of that offense, you're going to see more blitz packages and more interesting and intelligent blitz packages, not the usual stuff you'd expect to see. Because you guys know this, McDermott came under, under Jim, John, Jim Johnson uh, in Philadelphia, and Jim Johnson was one of the greatest blitz callers in pro football history. So it's not just what Leonard Floyd can do. It's what he can do – you know, in conjunction with a Puna Ford who they picked up, who is a big guy who can exert pressure and force double teams and do things like that. It's really how Floyd fits in that entire defensive line. And I think it's a really good fit. Is it too much to expect two 30 plus year old safeties to continue to play at a high level like Hyde and Poirier do? Certainly their, their injuries last year kind of give you the idea that maybe they're a little more fragile than you'd like. But when they're on the field, things really do change for this defense. Right. Well, the Taylor Rapp pickup is interesting because, excuse me, they, the Bills, you know, they want that two safety look and the, the slot position has always been very important and Dane Jackson has played that well. Taylor Rapp comes over, I mean, he was primarily a free safety for the Rams and he played a lot of free in the preseason, but, you know, he can, he can do multiple things and we don't, yeah, you know, there's only so many safeties you can talk about. I thought he was quite good in deep coverage with the Rams last year, and I think that will continue in the Bills defense. And the way he's able to sort of move around and do different things, that adds an element of, you know, they're the Bills play more nickel than any defense in the league. You guys know this. So they're not a heavy dime team, but if they wa wanted to run some big nickel, maybe some dime stuff, I think that's where Rap's presence becomes interesting because of his versatility. And yeah, you know, Hyde and, and Poyer, two years ago when Poyer allowed an opponent pass rating of 13.7, that's not sustainable. It's not going to happen year after year. He was still very good last year. But yeah, you want to kind of bring in some energy to, to bolster those guys and also to think about the future. Doug, thanks as always for the time. We appreciate it. We'll catch up with you down the line here. Enjoy the start of the regular season. Thanks, gentlemen. I appreciate it. All right, good convo with Doug there. We take the time now to remind you that we are presented here on Bills by the Numbers by FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the Buffalo Bills. Just download the app today and play any way you want. FanDuel is America's number one sportsbook. Plus, with live betting, 
You'll get updated odds on games that have already started. Best of all, you get paid your winnings fast. Make every moment more with FanDuel. We spin things over to the numbers game where Steve will be challenged with a bit of week one Bills history. Let's fire up the music. All right, Steve, question number one for you. How many receivers did the Bills keep on their initial 53-man roster in 2022, a year ago? Initial 53-man roster when it was set. How many receivers? Seven. You are correct, sir. Question number two. How many of those receivers can you name? Seven guys. Three. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Diggs, Diggs. Davis. Yep. Shakir. Correct. Yeah, three to go. Or four to go. Sorry. Four to go. How am I, how am I getting? Uh, who were they? Oh, you can get at least a few of these. I don't know. I think one guy is going to be particular, particularly it's not Cole tough B. for Cole you. Cole wasn't here. No, John he was Brown not. wasn't here. Uh, it was. You need some slot guys here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Isaiah McKenzie. Yep. Um, ding, ding. Yeah, no ding. Come on. Um, who, who's over there besides McKenzie? It would be. Oh, Kumaro. Kumaro, yes. Got that one. That was a good one. Um, I got, got two Kumaro. to go. Kumaro and who? Uh, Turner. Man, I don't know. Who's the guy that got hurt? I didn't even know who, who got hurt. Week mm-hmm. four, Baltimore got hurt. Missed the rest of the year. Oh, yeah. Um. Uh, Jameson Crowder. Boom. And one left, Steve. And this one's tricky because he went to IR. They, they activated him and he went to IR. Well, he was yeah, on the 53 yeah, he had and a, then went to He had a IR. foot injury. Right. A, re- a recurring foot injury. It was the second straight year he had the foot injury. Oh, he yeah, has uh, Isaiah Hodgins. No, not Isaiah Hodgins. Oh. He did not make the squad and He's then the went to the squad. Giants. Okay. Wow. Um, he is a former Bills draft choice. University of Houston. And had a nickname. Usually remember the nickname, guys. That's why, that's why, I, if I was coming out in the draft, you got to get yourself a cool nickname because that's what gets you drafted. And this guy had one. And he I did get drafted. And he didn't? And he did. He did. Um, Fifth round draft choice. What was his name? Who was it? 2021. I have no idea, bro. It is Marquez Speedy Stevenson. Oh, Marquez Stevenson. That's yeah, right. He was the seventh receiver to yeah, make the roster I always thought and Mar- went to IR. I thought Marquez always looked like Roy Roy Jones. Roy. Oh, yeah. the boxer? No, no, no. Roy. I can't remember the guy's name. All right. I can't remember. Old receiver back in the day the, for the Cardinals. Oh, Roy, Roy Green. Roy, Roy Green. Roy, Roy Green. Green. Good one. Gotcha. Yeah. Question number three. How many defensive backs did the Bills carry on their initial 53-man roster last season? Ten. That is correct. Nice job. Question number four. Which position groups are carrying more players on this year's 53-man roster than last year? Defensive line. Correct. And they are carrying ten. And I will say... They had nine last year. I will say... Offensive line. No, sorry. It is defensive back is the uh, other position yeah. group. They are carrying 11 this year. They really? carry 10 last year. Pretty good, though, Steve, in the numbers game. You got six out of the seven receivers yeah. from last year's carrying of seven, Mark which West might Stevens surprise some me. people. That's a pretty good job there in the numbers game. All right, it's that favorite part of the show where we ask our one burning question, and we touched on this a little bit already. This week, we ask, with Terrell Bernard now back practicing, what should be done at the middle linebacker position? I'm going to go with the controversial answer of Mm. nothing. Do nothing. Do nothing. So that means what? They're fine. No, no, I mean in terms of who's starting. Who should play? Yeah. Oh, see, if you're asking me who's playing. Yeah. um, 
Yeah, Dotson's going to start, get Bernard ready, but I think Christian Kirksey has got a chance to get ready and get on the field as well. So I'm, that's what I'm saying. You're going to start with Dodson because he's done the most work. Uh, Bernard is, should get a chance in practice to show that he could do it or can do it or is good enough to do it. Kirksey's the insurance policy. So, like I said, I don't think they're going to do anything different. I think Dodson has earned it through his work in training camp. And Bernard, since you know, I've, I, they saw some stuff in the run-up and the OTAs and all that, they know where his mind's at, and they see him every day. They know what he's talking about in the meetings. They hear his, con- his conversations. He's got it under his belt. They'll know how confident they can be in the fact that he can be ready to play when, even though he's healthy and hasn't played, taking reps. So, like I said, Dodson's the guy. Move forward. Get Kirksey up to speed. See how he does. But I think until Kirksey proves that he's got a handle on what's going on, Bernard is the backup. Okay. I'm going back to my gut feeling. I don't know why. I think if if this was an ideal world and everybody was healthy, I think Bernard was going to be tabbed to be the starting middle linebacker. I think if he shows enough in these two weeks leading up to the opener that he's got it down, knowing he's the best coverage option of the middle linebacker candidates and knowing he's probably one of the most instinctive guys in the run front. He's not the biggest, but he is one of the most instinctive I think if he shows enough in these two weeks in practice, I think he could be the week one starter. I don't know why. It's just a gut feeling I have. We'll see if it comes to fruition. Our closing figure deals with Buffalo's projected starting lineup for week one. Out of 22 starters total on offense and defense, the Bills return 15 starters from last year's squad, seven on offense and eight on defense. And that is not counting Tredavious White, who obviously did not start last season as an active player. More continuity than I think some people may have anticipated. That'll do it for this edition. We're back on our weekly schedule going forward, so make sure you subscribe on whatever podcast platform you use so you know when our next episode is available for you to enjoy. And remember, when you need to know about the Bills, you need to check Bills by the Numbers. For Steve Tasker, I'm Chris Brown. We'll catch you next week, everybody.